Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our medical podcast for all things in healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Nigar, and I'm thrilled to introduce our esteemed guest today, Dr. Lamia Ibrahim, a specialist in obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive endocrinology with over 15 years of expertise in infertility treatments. Dr. Lamia has a particular focus on complex cases such as infertility, polycystic ovarian syndrome, recurrent miscarriages, multiple IVF failures, and hysteroscopy. Today, we will delve into a very crucial topic that's gaining prominence in reproductive medicine, which is egg freezing. Dr. Lamia will be sharing her insights on when women should consider egg freezing, the process that's involved, its potential risks, and post-procedure care. So without further delay, let's dive into the world of egg freezing with Dr. Lamia Ibrahim. Welcome, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Nigar. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope everybody will benefit from this. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for joining our medical podcast. And it's an honor to have you um, on the stage on this important topic. Dr. Lamia, to begin with, when should women consider egg freezing? And what are the primary indications for this procedure? Uh, egg freezing is, is considered, it's, a, it's actually, I think it's, it's a very good uh, it's a very good invention now, and it's a very good progress in IVF. Uh, egg freezing should be considered uh, in a few uh, circumstances. I advise all women to check their ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve is checked by a blood test and an ultrasound to check how the ovary is. So if the ovarian reserve, which means, let me explain it in simple words, ovarian reserve is the content of the egg that at, are found in the ovaries of every woman. Uh, they are produced at before birth when we are created and it declines as the time goes and once we reach 45 to 49 years old it diminishes completely. The problem is nowadays uh, with so many factors, environmental, genetic, we are seeing a lot of reduction in the fertility and in the ovarian reserve. So, one of the main uh, needs for egg collection and freezing is if the ovarian reserve is low. This is number one, whether the woman is married or not married. That's why I advise to do a ovarian reserve test every year and see how is the ovarian reserve. And that's the indication number one. We do egg freezing as well when we have a problem with uh, malignancies and cancer. If a woman is diagnosed with cancer, she should freeze her eggs because the cancer treatment destroys the ovaries and the eggs. Uh, this is the second indication. The third indication, if there is a genetic problem, the woman can freeze their eggs. If for, let's say, we have uh, done IVF and we have produced, the woman has produced lots of eggs, then we can freeze some of them so that she can use it in the future. Absolutely, Dr. Lamia. It is very essential for women to understand that fertility declines with age and egg freezing um, offers a very good approach for those who wish to preserve their reproductive options. And especially as you have mentioned about the cancer treatment, uh, in particular here, the woman can have, I mean, the cancer treatment can have a, sim a significant impact on fertility, making egg freezing a very valuable option for many patients. Now, moving on to our next question, Dr. Lamia, are there any specific medical conditions or situations where you would advise against egg freezing? Uh, no. Actually, direct cause of advising the patient not to freeze her eggs. No, there is no indication. But there are some things that we have to consider. If uh, the woman has, for example, breast cancer, her proposal and her treatment plan will be a bit different because especially if her cancer is related to hormones, like uh, we say hormone-positive cancer because stimulation 
will enhance and trigger this. So in these cases, we advise to go slowly and use some specific medications that cannot affect the cancer. Uh, if there is a genetic problem with her uh, genital tract, then it might be difficult to do it. But there is no indication to say no, a woman should not freeze her eggs. Thank you so much for making that clear, Dr. Lamia. Now, moving on to our next question, could you please explain the egg freezing process in simple terms from initial consultation to retrieval? Initially, all women normally in the normal life produce many eggs every menstrual cycle, which happens every month, of course. So before their menstruation starts, their ovary, by uh, some uh, control from the brain, chooses some eggs, which let me just go back to the history. When the woman is uh, created in the womb, uh, they have about 9 million eggs in their ovaries produced. Once she is born, this number declines to 2 million. Once she reaches menarche and starts menstruating, the number is around 700,000. This 700,000 every month, the women lose about 500 to 1,000 eggs with their menstruation. These are recruited every month and a few of them are uh, progressing. And when we do an ultrasound, for example, we see the number of eggs that are in the ovary. So normally many eggs are, for, are recruited every month. But one of them, sometimes more than one, two, which is rare when we have twins, and for example, but normally one egg is, we call it the dominant egg or the follicle, we call it the follicle. I'm going to say egg because it's easier for the patients to understand it, but it's a follicle and inside the follicle, there is an egg. So the follicle is, some follicles are produced. Uh, once the body with the hormones, with the effects between there's an axis between the brain and, and the ovary. One egg is chosen to grow and to get fertilized, to ovulate and get fertilized every month. What happens to the other eggs? The other eggs are necrotized. They are dead. They die. So every woman, every month, she loses many eggs. One of them might produce, might grow and become a dominant follicle. And that's the one which, uh, can be fertilized so the others die so in the IVF process or in the egg freezing process it's it's partly IVF so what we do is we start stimulating the women with some medications we call them the gonadotrophins or some uh, oral medications but most, mostly we go for the gonadotrophins because we grow these follicles before they die before they are necrotized because that because before they become necrotic. So we grow all the eggs that are produced that month. We do not reduce the ovarian reserves. We grow the eggs which are produced already by the body at this cycle. We don't produce eggs, we just grow them. So once we give these in medications, we give them for about 10 days to two weeks, most of the women. We follow uh, the, the egg growth. We see the patient every three to five days. We see how is the growth, what is her response to the medication, to the dose we have given her. So if there is any delay or if there is any um, slow growth, we can increase the dose or we can sometimes need to change the medication. It depends on the response of every single patient. That's why we say it's an individualized treatment. So once the eggs reach a proper size, which is between 17 and 23, of course, not all of them will grow in the same pattern. Some of them will grow faster. Some of them will be a bit slower. So once we reach these mature sizes of the eggs, we give the patient what we call a trigger shot. A trigger shot is a medication that we give it to transfer the egg from an immature phase to a mature uh, what we call it from a primary oocyte into a secondary oocyte. The secondary oocyte is the oocyte that can be fertilized. So we give the trigger shot so that we can collect the eggs. Then we collect the eggs through a transvaginal. We get the ultrasound probe 
we put it through the vagina and we collect the eggs after 36 hours or 30, 34 to 40 hours of the trigger shot. So we put this probe of the ultrasound in the vagina. This is for married women. We put it in the vagina and through that we can collect the eggs through a needle under ultrasound guidance. We see the follicles and each follicle is collected. So we collect them, we give them to the lab, the lab uh, embryology lab. The embryologist is going to clean them and see then whether they are mature, whether they are in good uh, size and whether they are good uh, to freeze. Then after a few hours, they start freezing these eggs. The eggs are frozen. Uh, I'm saying eggs, unfortunately, but it's that oocytes. So these oocytes are all checked and they are frozen in the lab in small straws. And of course, they are labeled and uh, they are uh, verified and they get frozen in the lab. And the freezing is done and they can be kept for many, many years. Uh, each country has their own um, uh, timing. Some countries five years, sometimes 10 years, some countries 100 years, 50 years in some countries. So this can be done. The eggs are frozen. The patient, uh, the procedure of egg collection can be done under general anesthesia or under parasurvival block and sedation. If a patient doesn't want to go through general anesthesia, then she can have a parasurvival block and a sedation. This is for the married women. For the unmarried women who want to preserve their virginity, this procedure are now innovated and being created and it can be done through a transrectal uh, route. Uh, the, the, the rectum is cleaned the night before and then it can be done in the same way under ultrasound with a transrectal ultrasound and the eggs can be collected. Thank you so much for the great explanation, Dr. Lamia. This step-by-step -step breakdown helps make it clear, um, makes the egg freezing process very clear for our listeners. It is important for patients to understand what to expect at each stage from initial consultation to the retrieval procedure itself. Yes. Now, moving on to our next question. What are the potential risks or complications associated with egg retrieval and the freezing process, if there are any? Well, every procedure, every, everything medical has uh, side effects and some complications. But it depends on the uh, person and the surgeon doing it, if they have good experience, and if they are uh, okay with doing this procedure, the complications and the side effects are very, very, very low. Uh, uh, some of the complications that are, can be uh, seen are infections, of course, um, bleeding, and the most important thing, and which depends really on the uh, on the surgeon, is the perforation process to other organs, such as uh, the bowel or such as uh, blood vessels. These are the very important things, and these have to be considered clearly and, and, and very clearly and to be taken care of very well. But the rate is very, very low. We have done thousands and thank God we haven't seen many complications. Now coming to our final question for the day, Dr. Lamia, what post-procedure care and follow-up do you recommend for patients who have undergone egg freezing? Uh, the procedure is a very simple procedure, as I said. Usually the patients, uh, they don't need uh, much of analgesia for the pain. It's not a painful procedure. It's like a, a blood collection, but in a different location of the body. So usually we just give them simple paracetamol and most of the patients, they don't take it. Uh, we, of course, during the procedures, we give some antibiotics to, for, uh, to prevent uh, the occurrence of infection. Uh, the other thing is the patient, some of the patients, the only thing that uh, might affect the patient and we ask them to have a one day rest because of the anesthesia. Because the general anesthesia, they can get drowsy, they can get uh, a little bit dizzy. Uh, so we ask them not to drive their cars and uh, to have the day as a rest. Only one day is more than enough. The next day, all the patients can go back to their work. 
some of the patients when they are in a hurry and they cannot take a day off uh, we provide them with a paracervical block just a little bit of sedation they can still go to their work we advise them not to have any intercourse after the procedure because of the risk of infection uh, for at least five days to seven days and uh, no swimming in, in, in the swimming pool or in the sea or jacuzzi so that water or uh, to decrease the effects of that infection. Other than that, they live their lives normally. Uh, it doesn't take any problem. It doesn't cause any problems. And the next day, they are up to pursue their life again. Dr. Lamia, your depth of knowledge and dedication to reproductive medicine is truly commendable. We are very grateful for your willingness to share your expertise with us today and in providing the clarity to the process of egg freezing. Your passion for helping the patients navigate the fertility challenges is very evident and we're privileged and very honored to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Dr. Nega, for having me. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity in order to send my message. I am trying to make a campaign to an awareness campaign for all women, starting from age 17. Uh, all women should check their ovarian reserve from an early age. And it's just a simple blood test. If it's normal, live your life, do whatever you want. Uh, get married when you need, when you plan it do your studies, do your work. But if your ovarian reserve is low, please, please, please consider freezing your eggs so that you can use them anytime in the future. Let's say you are a working woman, you are a career woman, you are not free to have babies if you are married, or maybe you didn't get married and you don't want to have babies now. So at least check your ovarian reserve, freeze your eggs so that you can use them anytime you want because we see lots of cases who come to us in the late stage, even if they are young and their ovarian reserve is low and they are having much, many difficulties in having babies because of the low reserve and the poor quality of their eggs. So please do your test. It's a simple blood test. And if it's low, freeze your eggs so that you can serve your fertility and have your own babies. I hope it was an educational and an informative session. I hope everybody will benefit from it. And you are always welcome. And thank you very much for having me. Dr. Lamia, before we conclude, I would like to extend our best wishes to you as you embark on your upcoming campaign to raise awareness about egg freezing. I wish you all the best in this journey. And we're looking forward to many more podcasts together on our platform. Thanks a lot. And to our audience, if you have further questions or topics you would like us to explore, feel free to reach out. Remember, your journey to reproductive health is unique and seeking guidance from qualified professionals can make all the difference. Thank you once again, Dr. Lamia, and also thank you to our listeners. And until next time, take care and goodbye. <laughs>